Hello, I'm so pleased to welcome you to today's panel on the important topic of building effective community partnerships. I'm Courtney Bryan, the Executive Director of the Center for Court Innovation, and I'm gonna moderate the discussion. As some of you know, I started my career at the center over 20 years ago. My very first job out of college was here, um, and it was at the beginning of the community justice movement. At that time, it was just the Midtown Community Court. The concepts were simple and revolutionary. First, that justice is about people. Instead of merely processing cases day in and day out, we must pay attention to the people before us, address their individual needs, substance use, mental illness, trauma, unemployment, instead of using jail and fines. Two, that we need to pay attention to outcomes, what works and what doesn't, and adapt. We need to show leadership that courts are leaders in their communities and that they have the power to convene, to galvanize and to solve local problems. And finally, justice is not confined to or solely delivered in a courtroom. We must be active participants and be part of the neighborhoods we serve and partner with others to get this right. Residents, faith institutions, service providers, educators, law enforcement, business, the list goes on and on. And when I started in this field, community justice was an innovation. Now, more than ever, community justice is what the nation wants justice to look like everywhere. We know that these are many of the tools for creating safety, achieving racial equity, and helping people and communities thrive. Thinking outside the box and building strong community partnerships is essential to this. That's why I'm so pleased to kick off this terrific um, panel who's gonna help to inspire us and show us the way. Um, after the discussion, we're going to have some time for Q&A, so definitely save your questions uh, and, and we'll have time with the panelists to discuss those. Um, and before we kick into the conversation, I wanna turn it over to, my, uh, to our panelists today to introduce themselves. So I'm gonna ask each of you um, to say your name, your role, your jurisdiction, and, um, and when you, when you um, kind of became a member of this community justice and community court movement, so when you, you came into the community court family. Why don't we start with Melita? Can you introduce yourself and your role, where you're from and how long you've been with the community court? Hi, my name is Melita Strong and I, am, I work for City Square. I've worked for City Square for the last almost eight years. I've worked with the SKIP program, Second Chance Community Improvement Program for the last six years. My role is the program manager over case management. And I am located in Dallas, Texas. And I am excited about this transformative justice model that we are gonna be incorporating to help um, youthful offenders um, between the ages of 17 and 24. Thank you. Diane, can I turn it over to you? Yes. <clears throat> My name is Diane Whaley. I am the community court executive in the city of Olympia for our Olympia community court. I also oversee our uh, public defenders as well. I have been a part of this community court uh, community since 2015 when we started looking into creating a community court and we started up our program in 2016. Great, and Judge Calabresi. First, uh, congratulations, Courtney. You're a great choice to lead a truly critical organization considering the times. I did wanna say I miss seeing everyone and getting together to solve problems. Uh, I miss Birmingham, Judge Sparks. You and your team did a fantastic job. Uh, my name is Alex Calabresi, presiding judge at the Reddit Community Justice Center. Uh, we're multi-jurisdictional, criminal family uh, court, juvenile delinquency cases and housing. One judge court, I've been the judge since we opened 20 years ago in April of 2000. Thank you. And Judge Sparks, could you introduce yourself, where you're from, um, your role, and how long you've been affiliated with the community court? Courtney, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be with you today. My name is Andre Sparks. I have the honor of serving as the presiding judge for the city of Birmingham Municipal Court. We've been partnering with the Center for Court Innovation for about six years now, and we've learned the power of collaboration within our community. Thank you. Um, I think that's a great 
uh, segue to the to the first question that I wanted to ask of each of you, um, just to briefly talk about why collaboration is so valuable and critical um, as a component of of community courts. And Judge Sparks, you 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 said that it is. So I'd love to hear a little a little bit more about um, your your thoughts on why collaboration is so critical. Well, what we've discovered, um, Courtney, is that the opportunity for us to serve people requires tools that courts don't normally have. And in order for us to effectively support them, we need to bring in partners who do that every day. And that's been very beneficial to us because it doesn't take our manpower. All we do is turn them over to the subject matter experts and let them do what they do. It's been a great partnership for us and it's freed us up to create other partnerships in other areas since we see how well that that, that works. Thank you. Judge Calabresi, what what would you say? um, Why why do you find collaboration so valuable and critical to this model? You know, I want to tell a story. Um, Reddick was a really violent place. Uh, Top 10 crack infested communities, uh, according to Life Magazine, one of the most dangerous places to live. Um, it was a community under siege. So before we opened, uh, Courtney, I went out to the to a community meeting and I told them that that they were actually getting what they were promised by the Center for Court Innovation. We weren't bringing a local jail. Uh, we were bringing a court with services. Um, and afterwards, a woman came up to me and she said, are you really a judge? And I had a shirt and tie on. I thought I sounded kind of judicial. Um, I said, yeah, why? And she said, well, we've never had a judge out here. And she was said that she was shocked that a judge actually would go to a community meeting. And I was shocked and embarrassed to be a judge that I was part of a system where judges didn't take the time to go out to a community meeting and listen to the community. Um, And this disconnect between court and community showed in a survey before we opened, before the Red Hook opened, that the court system had only a 12% uh, trust and confidence in justice, 12% from from the community. When I told that story to staff at the Justice Center, a court officer agreed and said, no, our court needs to be part of our community. We're not gonna be isolated. We're not gonna be removed. And so everybody agreed. And I guess as, as as the judge, you want your court team to be out in the community. You have to set the example and be out in the community as as the leader of your team. And if you bridge that gap between court and community, you're gonna get results. Uh, As per our evaluation, trust and justice was over 90% for the Red Oak Community Justice Center. So for us, what we needed to do is bridge the gap between court and the community. And that was for us the most valuable partnership and collaboration out there working with our community. Thank you. Um, So Judge Sparks, you mentioned tools. Uh, Judge Calabrese, you mentioned trust um, as, as uh, again, why it's so valuable. Um, Melita, can I ask you, uh, in your role, why, again, is this collaboration so critical? So I really like that you started off talking about outcomes and how important outcomes are. I also liked how Judge Sparks talked about how we can't do this alone. One thing about um, collaborating is and and Judge Sparks did touch on this also, is that you don't have to do the work alone. You don't have to bear that whole burden of trying to figure everything out. You get to bring in other people's ideas, their skills, and and, and just just their their interests into into the model that you're trying to apply. Um, We're very goal-oriented here in SKIP not only for the participants, but also for the staff and the program. So when we all come together and we get community partners, I'm a community partner. We're a big community partner for SKIP. When we get other community partners to come in and give their ideas and and their skill set, it just helps the process flow easier. And we have the opportunity to achieve that success that we are looking for. So that's my two steps. Diane? Yes, you mentioned a a diversity of ideas. And for me, collaboration is pertinent on so many different levels with all the community court players because diversity of ideas will only make a community court stronger, more compassionate and successful. 
And finding common ground with diverse ideas is critical so that a community court program can survive. But from my perspective, I think of the valuable collaboration that takes place with our social service providers as I think of them as the backbone of our court. So first and foremost, every social service provider that we have has something unique and beautiful to offer. Collaborating under a one-stop shop approach for us with social services available either on the roof or at similar times in one place makes services easily accessible, immediate, efficient, and the process just so much less frustrating for the person in need of help. Navigating services all over the map can be so frustrating for a participant and repeating themselves and their needs can also be frustrating. This is why we in Olympia created a provider building adjacent to our courthouse so that all services can be found in one place pre-pandemic. And now during the pandemic, all of our services are in a one-stop shop on Zoom. Also when providers can communicate with the court and each other on what types of services that particular agency can provide and their perspective on the needs of the individual participant, everyone becomes empowered to understand how their services can align or piggyback off of one another and fill in the gaps to help that particular participant, which can only mean a better chance at success for the individual. Also, when trying to get to the root of how to individualize help, there's a recipe for success through collaboration, just depending on the issue. So we know that many problems can't be fixed with just one approach. We have to look at the big picture and work together. So for example, in our jurisdiction, if someone's houseless, we know that we need to connect them to housing services, but there are other aspects that need to be explored, such as employment, drugs and alcohol, mental health, victim services, or any other aspect of help that's needed. But by collaborating together in a community court setting, there's a much better chance at stabilizing the participant so they can be self-sufficient in the long run. And there's so much value to what can be accomplished by collaborating together. Thank you. The, how you're describing it, Diane, for me and, and all of you is really, again, a sort of emphasis how collaboration really ensures that what we're doing is, is people-centered. It's not about how do we serve institutions better. It's about how do we serve the individuals who are coming through, um, through our courts best and whether it's both sort of tailored services you know, not having a one size all approach, fits all approach, as well as the convenience and the kind of coordination that can happen that can can make accessing um, services more um, more efficient, as you said, and, and easier for people who um, often have a lot of, like all of us, um, have complexities um, in their lives to navigate. Um, I wanna, Diane, stick with you for a minute to kind of, um, to talk about this moment, um, this moment in history uh, with uh, COVID and the national reckoning on um, uh, racial justice, how you uh, and your court have seen those um, crises, and there's more, obviously, economic crisis and um, and others that kind of emanate from the, from these. Um, how you're seeing opportunity um, in, in this crisis and what challenges this crisis has presented that um, have had you have to adapt um, your practice to, to continue to do the good work. Yes, thank you. Well, in a COVID world now, our community court is operating via Zoom. So our providers are connecting via breakout rooms with our participants. So we've just had to adapt, but it allows providers an opportunity to easily connect with from anywhere quickly. And for some, they can connect on additional days that they originally would not have pre-COVID. And I've also noticed that some can remain on Zoom longer to be part of the community court process longer, which is really great. Also, our participants um, now connect with CMAR. This is an agency that we normally would use to sign people up for healthcare, but we've taken this a step further to make sure that our participants are informed of uh, COVID testing opportunities, flu shots, something that we feel is really important. So we've just had to adjust our connections there and, and make sure that people are well informed. As for challenges, the Zoom landscape can feel not as personal. So that's certainly something we're challenged with right now as we're all distanced apart and we're not under one roof and we're not face to face. 
in the past, our providers could just walk down the hallway and talk, but they can't do that now. So that certainly has its challenges. But right now we've adjusted, we've adjusted on Zoom and using breakout rooms so that we can best replicate what we had in person. We've also lost some of the immediacy of the services that community court can offer. So um, pre-pandemic, certainly uh, our defensive defendants would show up at arraignment and they would have an opportunity to immediately connect to services in person in our provider building. But in a, a COVID world, an in-person immediate meeting has not been possible at that building. So we just continue to adjust and find ways certainly to make up for that. As for our national reckoning on racial justice, uh, what I can say is this is the perfect time to reevaluate whether we have everyone at the table we should. Are we asking the right questions? Is there more we can learn from our present providers on this topic and our partners? Is there more we can learn from our participants? We have to ask these questions. And we wanna make sure given the current climate that everyone feels accepted, welcomed and well cared for. As of late in Olympia Community Court, we've really increased our collaboration more and more with law enforcement and having law enforcement at the table has been critical. This just brings opportunity for education, compassion and understanding all around. And if anything, spreading the word on the importance of community court and what it embodies is critical now more than ever with everyone that is justice involved. And a community court forum can make all the difference in increasing trust in our system. Thank you. Um, Judge Sparks, I wanted to ask the same of you just in this moment, what challenge, new challenges and new opportunities have, have you seen and embraced um, and managed? People don't really look at court as a place of help. That's a tone and a leadership vision that has to be set. We know we're dealing with people who are on the margins you're on the margins of life. Issues like COVID can absolutely upend. People don't run to the court under those circumstances, but if you have gotten used to going to the court for support and services, that may be the first social service place you come for that benefit. So what we've, have, what we've had to do is become more sensitive to people coming in and dealing with their court issues and not really talking about them. We've had to be a little bit more intrusive in asking them if they're okay, if they need anything, so that we can kind of steer them for the help that they need, but are somewhat reluctant to ask for. That means we've got to have our social workers, staff full of social workers who work for the court, stand by to help them in the areas of need. I found it to be the case, and I'm sure Judge Calabrese will tell you, you can't really talk to somebody about their rehabilitation issues you first make sure they have habilitation training. Once you got home together, home pretty solid, then they start talking to you a little bit more about getting better in life. We found that we have to push forward intentionally to help them do better. And most of the time, um, Courtney, when we get that together, the criminality goes away. It's gone. Thank you. Judge Calabrese? Our courthouse is, is closed, so it's a virtual calendar that we're doing in court. Uh, our clinic does individual counseling and links people to services like they did before. One important thing we're doing is uh, wellness checks for everything from uh, personal issues uh, and, and services that may need to economic issues, as everyone has discussed, uh, mental health issues, uh, and really trying to work with our youth through youth programming to make sure that during this difficult time, they're able to, to move forward. Um, our youth programs, uh, a strong lineup by CCI, um, Youth Impact, basically circle discussions on issues, which are really important these days. And then working with our partners uh, that operate two pro uh, photography programs, uh, an entrepreneurship program, which has been really great. Uh, Theater of the Oppressed, where young people are gonna write plays um, on the issues that they see. And this is obviously really important at this time. Uh, AmeriCorps and, and Bridging the Gap. Um, the wellness checks really have helped to identify um, issues that, that people have in our community that we can follow up with. And Judge Sparks is exactly what, what you're saying uh, about trying to, to make sure people have, have the, the abilities to, to go forward. And the one thing I have found 
is that people are more open uh, when they're talking on their phone from their car or from their home sometimes about the problems that they have and they need services with. So we're continuing to operate. We operate effectively, but it, obviously we would all prefer to be in our courthouse working with our community. Thank you. Melita, I wanted to ask you to jump into, and one thing, especially given your role, was thinking um, about access, or if you could talk a little bit about how um, you all are dealing with access to technology, given the reliance on technology and how many participants um, may not have easy access. So I'd love if you had thoughts on, on that um, as you talk about, you know, again, the sort of challenges and opportunities at this time and, and things, you know, practices that you want to continue potentially beyond, you know, the, this, this crisis moment. So I've taken a totally different approach with um, the lockdown and COVID and everything. And we've tried to turn it into a, a, a big positive. Um, one of the sayings that we say all the time is, all you got to do is turn on. You don't have to travel. All you have to do is just turn on. There's nothing easier than just turning on. There's no reason for you to miss court. There's no reason for you to miss case management. There's no reason for you to miss any appointment when everything is either telehealth or Zoom. So all you have to do is turn on. And, and just that repetition there helps, helps, helps the participant and it gives them ease. As far as other partners that we are connecting them to, they also are using this method like all of us are. And so once again, all you have to do is turn on, just turn on. Um, with COVID, one of the things that we do, especially every group that we have, we have a life skills group um, every other week, is that we do at least five to seven minutes on COVID updates about what's going on in the world and also what's going on in Dallas as far as people that have been affected and deaths and, and any testing sites. So we're given a lot of information. Not only are we given a lot of information, the participants are expected to participate in this. And so they also bring information about COVID to the table. Um, as far as technology, one of the things that we had to do was, well, well, not one of the things we had to do, one of the things that happened was a partner um, did donate funds so that every participant could have a laptop. So all of our participants have a laptop. We have spent time through, and thank you, Judge Sparks, for talking. I think it was Judge Sparks. It might have been Judge Calabrese. I don't know. It was one of you guys talking about the MiraCorps interns, but they have spent a great amount of time um, helping the participants learn how to navigate the technology because a lot of them just don't know. They don't know how, they don't know how to turn on or off the computer, let alone navigated my computer skills have, have have increased since covid just so you know um when we go to talking about the racial reckoning reckoning i i think that it's important that i share that most of the participants in our program are, are black and brown people and so to see this shift and this change is very empowering for a lot of them because they finally feel like maybe we're being heard Yet, on the other hand, there's still a lot of distrust from the system based on past experience or experience throughout their, their family. So to see this shift is, is just really, really eye-opening. And it also gives us an opportunity to have those tough conversations and those uncomfortable conversations about race and what it's going to take to heal not only the world, but just our community just our community. So real, real grateful to be a part of all of this, but I'm telling you, we are using Zoom um, as something, we're using it and saying it in a way that is very, very powerful. We had a young lady, we had a hearing, a, a unscheduled hearing today, judge called, and the young lady was late and judge was like, why are you late? You're at home. You didn't have to have any gas to get anywhere. There was no traffic you had to fight. Why are you late? And the young lady started crying. And I was like, so don't know why you're crying, but we'll talk about it later. So just things like that. I, I, I think that this, this can be turned into a positive if needed. Sorry I went so long, Courtney. No, no, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, I think, again, specific examples like that are great. I wanted to turn to Judge Calabrese to talk um, kind of building on this. Is And you mentioned, Judge Calabrese, a few 
um, partners and programs that you found essential during this time. And my question um, to all of you is to kind of think about a partnership that your court has that has that you think has had the greatest impact um, on on your program. Um, and tell us a little bit about that um, that partnership and who they are and, and why that is. So I'll start with you, Judge Calabrese. Thank you, Courtney. I think I forgot the second part of that last question. So I'm just going to say something um, quickly about that because I think it's important. We were contacted by um, New York City Police Department, a uh, first police commissioner on community partnerships um, about working with Red Hook to open the conversation between community and police. Um, and uh, one thing our excellent project director, Amanda Berman, proposed was that that conversation start with an admission by NYPD that they have a history of racism in enforcing the law. Uh, racism going back many decades that also she suggested should be part of educating officers so that they can understand a community's distrust, exactly what you were talking about, uh, Melita. Uh, there's a long history there. Uh, they are considering this as part of the proposals. They have to uh, make proposals to our governor about changing in NYPD and how to move forward. Um, but I thought that was a great idea that, that Amanda had and a great place to start. As to, to partnerships, um, you know, when we opened, um, we were overwhelmed by uh, people with substance abuse issues, uh, much more than we thought. So uh, our first partnerships really involved uh, drug treatment and that obviously that moved to also include trauma counseling with uh, under Julian Adler's uh, leadership. I learned a lot from clinic directors, especially our first clinic director on how to understand uh, substance abuse. So that was really important. But our partners also include um, the community uh, and NYPD who have each engaged in, in um, peacemaking training um, and together. Uh, the AmeriCorps program, uh, Melita, as, as you mentioned, has been fantastic. The Board of Ed that opened up a GED classroom in, in, in our second floor. You know, there's nothing more inspiring than a GED graduation ceremony um, that we do in the courtroom. Community needs have to dictate your programming and but those partnerships are gonna change as needs change. So right now, you know, community courts might have to bring in access to public assistance, housing, job retraining, uh, resume writing, uh, and with the loss of, of people uh, with so many job losses and mental health, that's obviously key. Thank you. Diane, can I turn to you next? What, what would you say is the partnership that you think has had the greatest impact on the court in Olympia? Yes. Well, just as your honor mentioned, drug health issues certainly rise to the top when I think of our um, prominent partnership needed. So when we first started community court, we did not have a budget. And without any money, we just could not get a drug and alcohol or mental health provider to collaborate with us. So we were able to get a housing provider, education, employment, and health care covered voluntarily, but not drug and alcohol health. That presented its own challenges for us and that anyone that was involved in our community court had to go out on their own and seek services in the community. That meant transportation on their own, financially on their own, and with limited navigation. So once we were grant funded by the Center for Court Innovation in 2016 and we obtained levy lid lift funding there forward, at the expiration of that grant, we were able to bring drug and alcohol and mental health provider services on board. So now we currently use uh, Pinnacle Peak as our provider services for both. And when an individual connects in community court, Pinnacle Peak has one person from their agency that links and evaluates for mental health and another that evaluates for drug and alcohol. And they are currently doing the breakout rooms in Zoom during the pandemic. Um, and they do this during community court and they set their appointments during their link. But they're great because treatment wise, they can treat the dual diagnosis if needed. And since bringing both drug and alcohol and mental health on board in our community court is links, they're tied neck and neck as our number one most highly used resource in our court. In fact, these links are so heavily used that we will be increasing our services in both of these areas in 2021 as we just thankfully received DOJ expansion funding. And these are issues that need addressed as early and efficiently as possible. So now that we have them on board as a community court provider, this means quick and efficient free evaluations, usually within a week of the first arraignment, 
which also means much earlier bed dates for those in need of inpatient treatment services. And prior to having these services, there would commonly be a two to six week wait at an agency in the community for a drug and alcohol evaluation, which is very frustrating, plus a three week inpatient treatment wait here in Washington. So now we can cut that process time down immensely. Also previously, when someone was in crisis, we just didn't have the ability to handle that person. But now we can immediately connect them to our mental health provider. I also want to mention one other critical and valuable partnership we've really appreciated is PIPE, that's Partners in Prevention Education. And they were originally brought in as an LGBTQIA connection, and it just turned out that they were helpful in just so many other ways. They are an organization that provides victim services on many different levels, and they provide advocacy, emotional support, and just so much more. And they've been a go-to for so many of our houseless participants. And having an agency that's trauma-informed a part of our program has just been invaluable. So many of our participants have a much deeper story to be heard. And having an agency that can really connect and understand these much deeper issues and then turn around and convey them in a community court setting, it only brings in increased sense of compassion for all of our participants. That's, I uh, thank you for sharing that. And I think it is so powerful to hear how these partnerships certainly serve participants, but they can impact the whole, as you said, Judge Sparks, the tone, the culture of, um, of the court and can, you know, teach all of us, in, including other, um, other partners uh, in, in ways that, you know, would not have happened had we not brought them together. Um, Judge Sparks, can I ask you um, who, who you would point to as, as having such a great impact on the, on the community court in Birmingham? We've had a great partnership by partners who provides drug counseling for probably the largest of the state. And um, interestingly enough, COVID has given me a perspective on their operations that I would not have without it because since we are doing virtual hearings now, um, inpatient treatment program, people would normally take a trip to court to see me, but now we can do it virtually from their location. So I kind of get a peek into community while they're in community, which is valuable for me in terms of dealing with them. And it also, it's, it's, it's uh, no different than the other members of our specialty court program who come in who I see virtually, they invite me into their home and I get to see their children and I get to see family members and I get to see a deeper connection to them. And guess what? I think it builds trust just a little bit. When somebody invites you to their home, it helps when it comes to dealing with them. So I've been so pleased, but Alethea House is the one name that I would call. There are other community partners, the Dannon Project here in Birmingham is, has been so great in terms of offering skill sets and training uh, for young folk who didn't take advantage of that when they were in a public school system. Now they can go back and get it and get a uh, job. But one of the things we've done and I've learned is that there are some areas of in the community that were not available for us to collaborate with. And I've had to push through and get some secondary programs at the court um, to point people the way. We've got a job coordinator who connects people to jobs, who works on staff every day. And seeing that collaboration has been extremely good. It, it also helps to build trust. But uh, those two community programs have been great. Um, I get to see the family just a little bit better. Thank you. Melita, you are a community partner, so I think you probably, <laughs> you have had great impact clearly on the project. Um, and so happy to hear if you would recommend, you know, suggest uh, another partner that you think has been useful. But I also wanted to turn to you to ask, as a partner, how does a court um, do this well in terms of drawing partners in, keeping them at the table, um, keeping them engaged, what has, you know, what has been useful? What do you think works? Um, certainly you're on the receiving end of that, hopefully, and we're brought in. So tell, tell us some lessons there. And then I want to turn to Diane with the same question. And, and, I, and I always have to emphasize that I've been with Skip. Um, I started three months after we took on the program. 
after the program started. So even though we're a partner, it just feels like home with us. Um, of course, I'm gonna say City Square provides all of the services, the best services, but in reality, there are a lot of other partners that bring a lot to the table. We have a partner um, that brings education to the table, who is um, allowing our part, they're allowing our part, our participants to go to school online through their program. Um, and it's just awesome. Our mental health and substance abuse partners, um, they also um, play a big role in making sure that our participants are staying on the straight and narrow as far as their mental health, making sure that they're taking their medication, making sure that they're attending their IOP groups and getting the education that they need. Um, I really liked what Judge Sparks talk, talked about how being on, on this platform with Zoom um, allows us the opportunity to look into the lives and the way that people live on Zoom. And it's true. It's very, very true that we do get a sneak peek into people's lives when we're on Zoom that we otherwise would not get if we were in the courthouse. Um, and, that, and sometimes you can see some of the barriers that affect them and some of the positive things that's going on in their lives just from that sneak preview. Um, I think that it's important for all, oh, one of the ways that we keep our partners engaged, that was the question. We have a MDT, a multidisciplinary team, and we meet every Wednesday with all of our partners. Every Wednesday we meet for an hour and a half and we discuss changes in their organization. I um, mean, this is how we keep them connected. We have a Zoom call, we talk about changes in their organizations. We talk about participants. Um, we do we do case studies, and we we just meet every week and we update each other on what's going on. So that's the way that we keep all of our partners in involved. Thank you, Diane. Can you address that? Um, how you? I know you were charged with kind of bringing folks in. Uh, so you're, you're the pitch woman who is out there making those pitches, curious to hear about how you were successful and then how you have found it um, helpful to keep people, how you keep people engaged. Yes, absolutely. So first and foremost, um, I was responsible for setting up those initial meetings when we were setting up our, our community court and looking for providers in our community. So I would just say first and foremost, when we were setting up those meetings, just make sure that you're connecting with someone who has the authority to say yes. And the most important lesson that I learned through that just initial process was make sure that you have uh, written materials handy for them. Because what I learned is that um, when you're trying to draw on partners in the community and providers, they make sure that you're legitimate. They wanna make sure they can understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish and, and they wanna make sure they can understand the process. So for us, I just borrowed materials and um, gave that to them until we had our own. Also, I would explain uh, with participant, that participants are mutual clients. And there's a win-win in, in, in certainly being a part of this process. This is an opportunity to connect our participant with your agency. That's, that's definitely a very common statement that I would make. And explain how to them how their company name will be used. This is a, a, certainly there's a promotional benefit to being a part of community court. You wanna make sure they understand the win for them as well. Um, explain that we're here to accomplish a, a holistic approach. We're doing this the non-traditional way and, and um, we're not going to be necessarily in, in our Olympia community court, we're not going to necessarily send them out to you. We need you here on site for a one-stop shop for easy access to services. and before it was certainly in our provider building and now certainly on Zoom. But you, you have to make sure that you can sell community court by explaining that participants have a voice in this process and we emphasize dignity and respect and we wanna build trust and confidence in the justice system. You could be a part of that. And they need to be able to see that end goal. And you definitely need to be sure to listen to your providers once you have them on board. Um, and, and as you're soliciting them as well, and ask what days work for them. How long can they stay? Do they need privacy? What supplies or technology do they need? Will they need to be paid? 
make sure they know you understand that their agency has needs as well as constraints as well. And make a schedule with them, certainly, but you also have to be flexible. Make sure they know you understand things come up and you just ask for good communication if they can't be present and a part of the process. And just make sure you explain why that's so important. But the more they understand the process and graduation dates, just the better. And I found that using that first yes, if you're just initially starting your community court, use that first yes to build upon the next and the, and the next. Certainly throughout the name of the providers that you have on board, so they can recognize, oh, hey, um, this agency is on board. For us, our first agency was CMAR. So certainly when I got that first yes, I, I turned around and I said, hey, CMAR is on board. How about you? Let's all, you know, let's be a part of this. So uh, definitely important so, so that everyone knows who's, who's together on this and who's working towards um, this type of um, great community court system. Also, keep them engaged by um, using provider informational sessions. This is something that we do in Olympia. We, pre-COVID, each provider would take a turn to give a presentation to the other providers every few months. So this provided each agency an opportunity to explain what they do and they could build connections with each other and they could sit down and talk to each other and, and just really kind of figure out, oh, hey, you do that as well. Oh, wow, you know, um, that's great because we really needed to, to um, have that type of connection to build on what we do. So um, that, those are really great. And I would just last say, when your providers are present and a part of your community court process or any partners, just make sure that you have to humanize this process. Make sure that you greet them and always thank them. They deserve that. They, you have to pay attention to their needs and invite them to things that matter. Communicate well to them and make sure to keep them informed of changes. Make sure that they're updated on contact information and make sure to email them anything that's interesting about your community court, any facts, and especially your accomplishments. They want to know that they're a part of something that um, is doing great things, certainly. And always invite them, I would say, when the Center for Court Innovation visits. That's, that's been a big one for us. When the center visited us, we had all of our providers present, and they just loved it. They really enjoyed um, hearing about, you know, the bigger picture and what's happening across the nation. So just make sure that your partners and your providers are always a part of as much as possible in this entire community court process. Um, and Diane, we can, we can do more of that uh, coming to your, to your community court now because we can do it like this. So, you know, again, technology opening up some windows for more um, engagement. So thank you. Um, and before I go to the, to the um, one of the final questions, I did wanna ask if, if uh, Judge Sparks or Judge Calabrese had any thoughts on, um, on you know, working well with, with partners and, and what you think has worked well in Birmingham and Red Hook. Well, I can go forward, Diane. Thank you for um, uh, talking about victims. Uh, CCI has built a great a relationship with Red Hook Cares and they're working straight through COVID. And victims really have to be number one um, for a court. Uh, and yes, prosecutors may take care of it if you've got a criminal court, but but you as a court need to provide services for victim. Um, you know, Courtney, you made a, a great point, and 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 that was um, that was that a community court should be a leader in the community and an active participant, and and everything really flows from there. Um, when people see you and, and, and the team out in the community, um, uh, they, they, and they see you all the time, the, the relationships just goes back and forth in so many different ways with so many different people. You build a, you build a reputation in the community as a, as a court that cares and provides services, but you really can't beat, that, that's what you want. Um, and that services are available on a walk-in basis. So that's fantastic. So I guess the only thing I would say is you can't, don't be out there for the photo op, you know, don't, don't think you can go there once or twice a year, get a picture in the paper and show, look how involved you are in the community because they'll see right through that. And as a judge, if you do that, your team will see right through that. So, you know, you need to be out there. And then you also need to remember that not everybody goes to, for example, police precinct meetings. Not everybody in the community is going to go there. Uh, not everybody's going to go to other meetings. So you, you got to go to regular events. You, you got to go to a, 
uh, you know, wh whatever community day that you have in, in a particular area. Uh, for me, I went out to Little League a lot and I would see everybody, a lot of people at, at Little League and they would just come up and talk and I'd tell them about the Justice Center and things like that. So, um, uh, and also graduations like like our photo uh, class when they have a graduation, you, you, you go to that and sometimes that used to be before COVID in the library and things, you just, you know, you got to try to get to everybody in the community and when they see you out there, the relationships are going to flow. Um, the only other thing to say, you know, you had, uh, the second part of the question talked about including community members impacted by your work. And it first, uh, it first hit me that, that most people impacted would be right in the courtroom. So I, I thought of, of making sure that anybody who comes through your court knows that they're uh, a valued part of the community, holistic, as you said, Diane, procedural justice is at the heart of what we do, listening to them as, as, as we all them know, giving them a voice. And then being guided when you listen to them, being guided by your future actions, perhaps as a judge, when, when you hear what how they thought of the system, understand that they're a user. You know, James Brodick loves to, to talk about, you know, their customers. And that's really the right way to do it. And even NYPD is seeing seeing the community as customers. And that, that's what we need to do and listen to them. I wanted to turn to um, the question. Uh, this is for, for Melita and Diane to weigh in on this and Judge Calabresi raised it in terms of thinking about community members, um, which include those who have, who come through our community courts um, after being arrested, cited, you know, who are users, um, customers, clients, um, participants, and how, you know, increasingly I think we are focused on centering their needs as well as um, uh, engaging them in what, you know, co-designing what justice should look like. And so I'm curious if um, Diana and Molita, if you have um, thoughts on how your courts are um, engaging those who are directly impacted by um, the justice system who are coming through the courts um, as litigants and defendants, in, in helping to inform your responses and strengthen your your um, your court. Um, Diane, I'll, I'll turn to you first. Well, in Olympia, um, certainly our participants have a huge voice. So from the very beginning, um, we actually, uh, first they, they certainly talk to a public defender coming through, but in our community court, we make sure that our, our participants sit down with both the public defender and the prosecutor when um, before they start um, their, their opt-in process. So um, during the opt-in process, our participant will um, certainly engage in a conversation with, um, with both the prosecutor and the public defender in order to formulate their conditions so that there's a, a thorough understanding of what they're getting themselves into. And most importantly, so that our participant has a voice on, here's who I am, here are what my needs are. And it's really important that everyone um, be able to, to hear, all parties are able to hear exactly what their background is and where they're coming from and, and um, just have a thorough understanding of how are we gonna make it this person successful in this program? So you really need all parties at the table. And that's something that we, we didn't do from the very beginning. We actually changed that process as we moved along and just really felt that was really important to have everyone at the table. I would also say that, um, you know, we, we also, um, on the flip side, you know, once a participant is in and certainly coming back, um, back and back, we also continue to have our participant continually engage in that process of talking to the prosecutor as well as the public defender and, and their updates on where they are, are there any adjustments that need to be made along the way? And certainly sometimes adjustments just do need to be made, but they do get to continue um, to engage in that conversation and, and give that input and it's very valued. And I would say that once they are successfully through the program, we also really value their feedback and, and that only helps us build on creating a better program. So we use uh, participant exit surveys so that we can get their input so that we can truly understand you know, what they appreciated. They're able to give written feedback um, on, on anything and everything that they felt. And we can take any comments and certainly make change or we can certainly build on their positivity, which we always enjoy. 
So having that participant survey has just been so imperative so that we can really self-reflect and understand, you know, this is what the participant really felt and certainly um, uh, helps us um, gauge and evaluate what we're doing. We also have made a concerted effort as well with our graduates to try and incorporate them back into our program um, when, when and if we can. So we have had um, some of our graduates come back and volunteer. They volunteered certainly in our garden and engaging with other participants and just trying to make those connections. Um, they've come back and they've been able to give valuable advice to our participants and just give that extra added support, um, just knowing they, they used to be where they were so they can relate and they can say, you know, the things that, that just need to be said so they know that they're not alone. And so we've really enjoyed bringing back um, some of our graduates to be a part of that process and just to continue to get that really valuable input and give us also additional advice along the way so we can continue to, uh, to build on our program. Thank you. Melita, any advice or strategies to share here about engaging folks who are users of our, our justice system? So the first step for us on this end is when they first come to the program, they meet with our program director and our public defender. The program director explains the program and the expectations. The, the public defender makes sure, makes sure that they understand their rights. After they do that, they come and do an assessment with me where I gather quite a bit of information. Um, however, just to be very, very transparent, most of our participants that come in, they are under the influence of marijuana. Um, or some other type of drug. So, and when I say marijuana, they're smoking anywhere from five to 20 blunts a day, right? So a lot of the information that we get is just a little bit mm, tweaked and not truthful, right? So it's hard to gauge them in the beginning on what they really want. So that's why we give them, that's why we try to connect them with services as soon as they come in with the doctor um, making sure that they get a health physical, make sure that we're not dealing with high blood pressure, diabetes, anything like that. Um, we try to get them to uh, a mental health um, professional, one of our partners to address any, so that they can start understanding what depression looks like because a lot of them come in and they think that depression means that you sleep all day. They don't know that you can function with depression and most of them are. Um, and we also get them a substance abuse assessment to, to, to address those issues. Um, we have more people that come in under the influence than not. So once we get them stabilized within the next 30 to 60 days is when we start flushing out. And that comes from that one-on-one -on -one meeting that they have with me every week. We meet once a week, every week for an hour or longer. It just depends on what's going on. And that's where I'm able to flush out a lot of information and figure out what is it that you wanted to do with your life? What are the goals that you want to, to um, reach? Um, their voice is very important, like Diane said. Um, I cannot do this work without them. So I am never confused that this is not my life. It's not about what I want. It's about what they want. Everybody that comes into this program does not want to go to school. Um, some people don't want to work. They want to go to school. So we have to figure out what works best, not only uh, for what they want, but also be a very realistic on, on what they need also, because you can't say you don't wanna work, don't have an income and you have no place to live. That, that just won't work. So we also have to do some accountability also in this process. I talked about the life skills group. There's an, that life skills group is a safe place for them to be able to come together and peer support peer and share their thoughts, but also encouragement and other peers are able to hold you accountable as well. With our partners, I wanted to talk about one of our partners, CCA, who provides the high school diploma. Um, one of the very few programs here in Dallas, Texas that will allow a uh, participant to obtain his high school diploma up until the age of 26 years old. And how um, powerful that program is because it allow, it's online, they have a teacher who's teaching it. And here are people who wanted their high school diploma, but just could not do it in a classroom setting and they're striving in it. So um, I think that the more that 
you have them buy into what they want in their life, the better outcome you will have the better outcome you will have. We also have participants who have graduated and also participants that have been terminated that we still allow to come back to group. You can still, because this is community. Group is, so let me share this with y'all really quick, Courtney. Group is the community. When I was growing up, my mom has three sisters, three brothers. So big family. So I would go, we would go to my auntie's house or my uncle's house. It was always something going on. In today's world, that's not what's happening. In today's world, parents are using drugs with their kids and they're listening to the same music that they're listening to, right? So there's not a lot of wisdom and there's not a lot of love and there's not a lot of structure. And that's not to, to make anybody um, feel less than is just the reality of what it is. And when you come to group, we're talking about all those things. Um, I don't know if y'all know what this means because I told y'all I was 26 once before, but I like to, I like to pan on them. I'd be like, why is your hair that big looking like Whitney Houston from 1980? And they just laugh so hard because it's community. And in community, you laugh, you joke, you get honest. People hold you accountable. They say, hey, what are you doing? All of this builds who they want to be, who they want to be. So I hope I answered your question. I know I- You did, you did, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Melita. Um, so I wanna, uh, uh, I think we're getting up to an hour and I wanted to just um, have uh, you all be able to have the final word before we then will um, close and then there'll be a live Q and A. Um, and I can start with you. Judge Calabrese, which is, um, you know, any, obviously any reaction to anything that, that was shared that you didn't have a chance to address, but would really love if you wanted to share, if you could share sort of one lesson, whether it was a like aha moment or something we did differently or a lesson that you think is just critical to impart um, to uh, the folks out in the audience on, on this topic. So I'll turn it to you, Judge Calabrese first. Well, um Courtney, I just want, I want to use this opportunity with, within my time to uh, really talk to the community court family. Um, this is a critical moment for social justice reform around the world. Uh, criminal justice experts, social justice professionals, universities, law school, they're all laser focused on court systems everywhere. And they're going to be critically examining court systems to find the significant changes that they will say must be made. And while community courts are unique, and we each have our own uh, function and purpose in our community. Uh, and we're designed to address local community issues. Think of what we do as the community court family. Reformers will want courts to be effective and stop recycling people through the court system. So they're gonna look at our problem solving approach that we all take. They're gonna demand that courts reduce incarceration. So they're gonna look at the community court approach that uses services rather than jail, both pretrial and at sentence. They're going to want courts to treat people as people and not docket numbers. And we see court participants as part of our community before they had a case, while it's pending, and when it's over. And we use procedural justice throughout our buildings, a principle fundamental to community courts. They know the reformers, know the importance of courts rebuilding trust and confidence and justice in the community. We increase the community's trust and confidence and justice by the work we do every day, and we build respect for the court system. This is so important during a time of change. Finally, criminal justice reform experts all know the challenges facing police and community as we move forward. They're gonna to look to courts that historically bring police and community together as a place to start the necessary conversations. Now more than ever, an open dialogue is needed to discuss how we should go forward together doing justice and how involved we want the police to be in our community. And court budgets are a significant barrier to change, but documented results from our independent evaluation so community court approach, while it reduces crime, reduces incarceration, reduces recidivism, builds trust and confidence in justice is also saving significant tra taxpayer dollars. The ex experts will see that community courts are providing better, fairer, and more compassionate justice than the traditional court approach. They will see we are bringing essential services and solutions to our communities and that we care. You know, we know that we have people coming back just to check in, just to let us know how they're doing. They're coming back to a courthouse 
to tell us they're doing well and doing better because they know that we care. That's the type of court we bring and type of services and passion we bring to our work. What criminal justice reform experts are looking for in court systems everywhere is in our DNA. It is what we do every day. They will want courts to do justice based on our fundamental principles. The results we achieve for our communities are the results they will want and demand from every court everywhere. This is our time. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. That was incredibly powerful. And um, as you said, this is, uh, it's in our DNA. We, we are offering lessons here for community court practitioners, but we as a family um, of, and a movement have, have uh, offer the roadmap for um, how, to, how to do this at scale. Um, thank you. So I'll turn to Diane and then Molita and then Judge Sparks, I'll ask you to, to um, close this out. Thank you, Courtney. Well, having been in the criminal justice system for over 20 years, I've been working as a criminal defense attorney for uh, many, many years. And if there's anything that I can say that is just so critical um, in, this, in this community court community, especially, it's relationships, relationships, relationships. This is definitely just imperative. And you have to take the time to get to know people. You have to take the time to get to know your community partners to be successful. You have to care about people. And it's just really important that everyone in the community court process understands what the purpose is of each partnership. You want consistency as much as possible within your partnerships. I know that in Olympia, our process is only smoother when we have the same social service representative return. That's all a part of building relationships. We love having a familiar face uh, coming back week after week. That's not only great for us uh, working in the program, but also for our participants. That's only a huge benefit for them to see familiar faces, knowing that people care and they come back week after week knowing that they care. So building those relationships is just so imperative. Also, it's really important to know for the people that are involved in, in coming back week after week as a partner, it's good to get to know the individual and why are they there? I love finding out why someone from an agency is actually involved in our community court process. You know, it's important to ask because you want to know, have they been justice involved themselves? Or do they, maybe they have a vested interest for, interest for another reason, but it's just really important to know why they're there and why this is so important to them as well. Finding those connections is just, is just so great. But most importantly, I would say, in addition to all those relationships that you're building, if I had a takeaway, it would be give your community court partners and providers, you want to make sure they will have a voice. And they're the most valued resource we have in our community court, our, our community court social service providers, because they're the experts in the field. And if we're going to reduce recidivism and we're truly going to help people get on their feet to be self-sufficient, we all need to stop and listen to those that are really good at what they do. In Olympia, we have our social service providers provide written follow-up on the same day they meet with our participants in the morning. And once we go to court, we invite our social service providers to join us in court to truly be a part of our holistic approach. And in our court uh, Zoom environment, the judge, the attorneys, the case manager can all turn to them and ask any questions needed as issues arise. And we did the same thing even when we were all in person. And our providers can raise their hand, they can speak out and they can use their chat feature, but they can offer additional information that will help at the time. And providing timely and accurate information can be so critical from our partners. And it's, it's just so helpful to have. But it's so important to make sure that those that are providing the services know they matter and have a voice in the process because without them, we would lose our sense of community. And when we are in court, the participant can feel that sense of community. That's so important because they see all of the support right there in one place. And many of our providers in Olympia, they're volunteers and we know that their time is valuable. So they wanna see that their time invested has contributed to a positive outcome. 
So having them personally see the process play out is just so rewarding and educational for them as well. By coming to court, they can see exactly what they're contributing to. And in the end, really, we are all only stronger and better having our best resources at the table working together. Thank you so much. Melita? I would say that um, a community court should be a leader in the community. It should collaborate with community members and it should have a reputation that cares about the people that we serve and the people that we are responsible for. Thank you. Judge Sparks, bring us home. Well, it was great listening to all of their closing statements and closing arguments. And it's validating that what, what we're trying to do for goodwill are doing them already. Judge Calla, Reese's closing was magnificent and it hit all the tones that I think anybody looking to do something different in their court would want to hear. I want to I wanna say that each one of these community courts requires as an essential leadership. Somebody's got to step up and say a new tone is needed. And whether they like it or not, the leadership starts at the top. There's got to be a judge in there somewhere who's willing to strike out and do something just a little bit different. And they're going to take some lumps and bruises with it, but it's going to be worth it in the end. And I hope when the jurists hear this, they'll understand that they're, they're not Gilligan on an island by themselves. There are a whole lot of folks out there who are helping and trying to do the right thing. It's entirely possible to hold people accountable, but do it with compassion. I think we can continue setting that example. Glad the Center for Court Innovation provides a forum for like-minded courts to come together and thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I just wanna close with an invitation and a challenge to the folks uh, who are listening now um, to really use this time. I think this, this unprecedented, incredibly challenging time, critical time to, um, to try one new thing, do one new thing, whether it's a new partner, a new practice, a call that you wouldn't have made before, um, a thank you that you may have forgotten uh, to just to deepen your collaboration, deepen um, the the bench, uh, populate the island, <laughs> uh, so that that we can go and um, and 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 live the 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 promise of of true justice in in this country. So, um, thank you so much to the panelists. I've learned so much during this time from you all, um, and thank you for your commitment and your, and your work. Hello to everybody out there in uh, our, our virtual conference uh, community. Nice to, to be with you. Um, we got a few questions that I'm excited to, to field um, or to, to have the, the panel field. So I'm going to just uh, start now. Uh, we got a question on how do you assess the effectiveness of your partnerships for the people that you serve in, um, in your court? And so I want to turn first to Diane to, to talk about that. And, and there was also a question, Diane, um, that we received about the partner pipe. So I wanted you to be able to, to share that information too, just so the, the person who asked that question got that. Thank you so much, Courtney, and good morning, everyone. Um, so Partners in Prevention Education, that is what PIPE stands for, just to answer that question just briefly. Second, um, the uh, assessing effectiveness of partnerships. So first of all, in Olympia, we keep statistics on everything. So we're tracking data um, each court session. We're keeping track of the links that are being made. And when I say links, I mean, um, connecting our participants with the social service providers um, each Wednesday in our community court. And certainly we're looking at um, when somebody connects, we're looking at um, who's graduated, 
we're looking at the overall um, aspect of the conditions as to what made that person successful, certainly. But success, we have to remember, is always individual. And there's not just a, um, that's not in, in just a one recipe. It's always different for each individual. So uh, I would say it's really important to look at the data and what connections are being made to make somebody successful. Uh, we also want to look at recidivism rates as well. Um, but as far as partnerships go, um, again, we want to review feedback, um, certainly from our participants. We want to listen to them as they're in court and what they're saying as far as um, how things are going when they're meeting with people, um, whether or not that partner is following through with their appointments, certainly on the outside. And we also review their exit survey as well um, to make sure that they had a positive um, interaction certainly with um, the partners that we have in our community court. Um, I would also say that in assessing, um, we also um, receive, as I kind of talked about earlier, feedback from each um, provider when they meet and link with someone, they provide written feedback to us so that we can incorporate um, what that discussion was about and what their recommendation is. We incorporate that into the conditions and to the court order. So it's really important to pay attention to what the provider is saying um, and what that feedback is all about and certainly looking at the effectiveness of that feedback and incorporating that into the court order. Thank you. Melita and then Judge Calabrese. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the ways that we as assess the effectiveness, effectiveness of our partnerships is the impact and the reporting from the participant. Participants are, are the best um, resource, the best person to say if a partnership is working and the service, and if the services are working, that we don't stop there, but that is our, our main goal. Um, just for example, we had a young lady who's been um, in anger management for the last couple of months, and she's talked about how much she likes it and how much she's learned and her counselor has now um, recommended that she comes to counseling. She was going every week, now she goes every other week. Um, and so that partnership where she, where they were able to deliver, give a service, deliver a service and she was able to get something from it, that speaks volumes, that speaks volumes. We also um, measure the effectiveness by our data, how many people we referred, um, what was the impact of the service from the partner. We also have, and I shared this in the recording, we also have the MDT team where our partners come and we meet on a regular basis and they're able to tell us what's new in their organization, um, the things that they're doing to um, um, meet the needs of our participants. And I think that that's how we really, really are able to figure out, is this working? Is this a partnership that's worth staying, that's worth keeping? And it is, for, most, for the most part. Thank you, Judge Calabrese. I think, first of all, you need to monitor the culture of the court in terms of uh, procedural justice and make sure that's happening everywhere. I'll tell you, when we first started out, um, whenever another judge came, I'm talking about the first couple of years, whenever another other judge came, if that judge was not um, engaging in procedural justice, the whole court kind of went that way. Um, and the, it, it, it felt it was a different kind of court, let's put it that way. Um, but now what's happened is we've done it for so long, over 20 years, uh, there is a firm culture in the court of procedural justice. And um, let's just say recently I had another judge sit in for me and uh, I heard how uh, that judge from everybody that that judge was not engaging in procedural justice. So uh, it kind of flipped, but I think that's important. You gotta make sure that that procedural justice is always everywhere, not just the courtroom. Um, as Melita said, you hear from the participants and I hear from them in the, in the courtroom asking them, you know, how can, and you can tell how connected they are with, with our clinic, they have a fantastic clinic that really engages people and you can, you can hear that. So you're, you know, you gain confidence in those services. Uh, I also hear peacemaking agreements. Peacemaking, peacemaking agreements are fantastic. A lot of thoughts put into that. Um, and you hear from both victims and offenders. Victims really appreciate peacemaking. As far as youth programming, um, I think it's good to observe and participate. 
I do think there's a certain responsibility the judge has over the entire courthouse. Certainly, probably if something goes wrong, they'll be, they'll be blaming you. So you might as well have responsibility for it. So at least check in and make sure things are going well. And, and I'm fortunate to be to be in a fantastic place. Um, and it, I also think it's good to make yourself available so that you don't feel separate and they don't they don't think that you're separate. So I make I make it clear I'm available to anybody. And we're fortunate enough to have a housing resource center. Well, so we're in constant connection with our tenants. Um, so so we're able to pretty much cover the community. And again, we're doing wellness checks now. So we're, we're able to monitor, you know, our role in the community. And I'll just throw this out because I was so proud. They gave out Thanksgiving meals, took pictures to our community. So we're still working with our community and you get that feedback. Thank you. I'm gonna turn to the second question. Uh, well, it's two questions, but they both are related to access to technology during this time. And, um, you know, there's great promise uh, with technology and also barriers. And, and we did talk a little bit about that during the session, but I wanted to start with the question around access. How, do, how are folks um, ensuring access to services for participants who don't have access to the internet or to Zoom? Um, and I want to start with Diane, if you can answer that. And, uh, and Molita, if you had an, an, another, um, anything to share as well. Yes, in our community court, we have a provider building which uh, we have opened up with um, several computers so that if someone does not have computer access nor phone access to Zoom, since we're operating on Zoom, they can come to our provider building and they can actually sit down at a computer. We have our wonderful court administrator there, as well as a representative from probation that can help assist them to connect them on our community court Zoom session. And then once um, they are connected, they can just maneuver around in the Zoom session to breakout rooms to connect with the providers in our community court. So that's how we've been able to tailor and to adjust to help those that do not have um, access to internet, computer, or phones. I realize we only have a few minutes left for this. So I want to, Melita, anything to add um, that you guys are doing innovatively? Yes, yeah, so we're making sure that all of the participants have laptops, as I stated earlier, um, and also most of our participants have cell phones, so they can definitely connect to the services via cell phone. Most of them have cell phones with with Wi-Fi, so 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 it's not as big of a barrier as it could be. Um, but we are working very very hard to make sure everyone has a laptop and everyone is either connected to free free Wi-Fi or reduced Wi-Fi, reduced Wi-Fi. I do want to say this. I'm not going to say that, but I was going to just put something out there. There is a Wi-Fi provider that provides Wi-Fi for $10 a month if you receive SNAP benefits. And some of our participants do, so. Thank you. Um, really quickly on access to the court, that was another question. Um, Judge Sparks, is it, are you dealing with that? Uh, people who don't have internet access in terms of attending virtual court appearances, how are you managing that? Yeah, so, uh, Courtney, that's a major problem. And it's probably one that's going to involve the total government and not just the court system. We're simply gonna to have to make broadband available to everyone. And we simply don't have the resources just as a court system to make that happen. We're depending on the good graces of the, uh, of the uh, community to help us out. But one thing we do have is access to, uh, to the library system, the public library system. We can steer people there so that they can utilize those facilities. Here in Birmingham, we have a dynamic library system. And so we do that. We also have the benefit of the faith-based community that is absolutely full of Wi-Fi right now. And if they'll simply open up maybe a portion of their church or even expand their Wi-Fi to stretch to their parking lot areas, then our folks can go there and access Wi-Fi, just like Starbucks can do it. Uh, First Baptist can do it as well. And so we simply have to get out and, and, and advocate for that. Uh, that helps some of our access problems. Thank you. Um, next question, Judge Calabresi, if you could speak to this question um, about how partnerships uh, have been affected during this time of national reckoning uh, around law enforcement and calls to defund the police. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about what, if any impact um, there has been on partnerships in at the Red Hook Community Justice Center. 
Sure, I can um, try to cover this a uh, little bit quickly because of the time. Um, NYPD and, uh, and other police forces, I believe, are they're trying to figure out their role going forward. Hopefully they understand that they can't be an occupying force, uh, meaning they need to connect with the community. So for us, uh, CCI is fantastic working with the New York City Police Department in terms of policy. Again, um, there was uh, an important conversation about starting from an apology. Where are you going to start from if you want trying to reach the community? Starting with an apology for decades of, of, of racism and, and training officers to understand why, you know, they show up at a door they, they've never been to. Uh, no reason to believe they will be met with resistance. Why they're met with resistance. Not, it's not them. It's the uniform going back decades. Uh, I think that training is important. The other training I think is really important is procedural justice. If you think about the, the research on police procedural justice for the court system, reducing crime, uh, the same thing would work for the police and it actually may even have a, a greater effect in terms of crime reduction. If people are treated fairly and people are respected by the police when, when they interact with the police in the, in the precinct or out in the community. So I think, I think it's important that, that training on procedural justice for PD uh, would be important. And then community courts are, are the perfect medium for bringing police and community together. Um, for us, obviously we have a lot of connections, you know, built up over, over 20 years, uh, connections uh, with uh, uh, community leaders and, and peacemakers, uh, connections with the, the youth through our youth programming. And we're talking about doing Zooms uh, and maybe even peacemaking sessions with PD and connections with, with our tenants. So you, you, you're able to get a wide perspective. You just don't wanna be the picking the leaders to work with the police. You wanna give everyone an opportunity. So we can bring the community to the police and I think other community courts can bring community to police. Um, and, and it's just a question of, of how, how, how strong is that relationship and making it stronger, making them understand that, that we have the relationships that, that they need to take advantage of, at least in terms of trying to figure out what does the community want going forward doing justice. Thank you. And I know we're at 1201. I do wanna just um, in, in one minute um, get to the, this last question, Judge uh, Sparks, if you could just speak on this and it sort of builds on what Judge Calabrese uh, mentioned. One of the questions was a, a, a important a reminder that the community the community is is not a, is not a monolith as the the person who raised the question um, shared at their competing views and values in, in all communities and um, just a word of advice on on navigating that um, the where there are competing views and, and values and any advice that you can offer from Birmingham judge sparks well what I found that's extremely important is to listen to opposing views and come to those areas where there are, in fact, where you do have agreement. But at some point, at some point in, in every process, a vision has to be said and someone has to follow that. And when there's disagreement, um, you try to uh, intertwine those issues as much as possible. And I, and I think that's the same thing with these issues. No one is going to be completely happy with the concept that community courts bring to bear, but the product itself is unquestionably good. And if there's someone who has something better, then I would suggest they come to the table and offer it to us. Uh, this has been working. And Courtney, on that last issue uh, about the access, we're going to quickly, the more technology is used in courts, we're gonna quickly uh, get into a procedural due process problem when we're utilizing, utilizing technology to bring people into the justice uh, arena and they don't have the equipment or the access to it. And so it's something that the legislate, le legislative branch of a city and the uh, executive branch will have to address in order to make sure that we have procedural due process for everyone who's being involved. That's an issue that's going to come. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, thank you to our, our panelists for joining again. Uh, thank you all for, for listening. We're now going into um, an intermission session. I want to just also share that uh, one of the breakout sessions, there are several questions that we didn't answer that were uh, really, I think, going to be answered in the breakout session, planning a community court. They were kind of operational questions, how it works, people's experience um, in a more granular way. So I would just encourage those who have those kinds of questions to attend that breakout. Um, thank you again to everybody and enjoy the rest of the conference today. <laughs>